Uh, my name is Mark LaFrambois. I'm the senior book buyer here at Politics and Prose. And on behalf of our owners and our staff, it's my pleasure to welcome you on this beautiful day. We appreciate that you came in from that and uh, in here to come join us. So thanks. In Bernie Gunther, Philip Kerr has created one of the most interesting and complex characters in contemporary detective fiction. As a private investigator, a former cop, Gunther is a, is cyn is a cynical and tough talking sleuth working in the corrupt and murderous environment of the Nazi era. The Bernie Gunther series of historical mysteries won the British Crime Writers Association Ellis Peters Historical Fiction Award in 2009, as well as Spain's PBA International Prize for Crime Writing. We're lucky that he is able to join us this afternoon to talk about his latest book, A Man Without Breath. Please help me welcome Philip Kerr. Thank you. Um, on a day like this, I'm always grateful that people have turned up. So thank you very much. In England, if this was England, no one would be here because, um, you know, it's it's a sunny day, and quite frankly, uh, they've all got better things to do on a day like this, which is get out in the sun because we get so little of it. Um, I'm this. I'm into ending my second week of an American book tour. Uh, I will say there's only one thing worse than doing an American book tour, and that's not being asked to do an American book tour. Uh, before I left, uh, I said to a friend of mine, a, a Booker Prize-winning novelist who will uh, escape name, he said, let's have lunch next week, Phil. I said, I can't. I'm going on my American book tour. And he looked slightly green, you know. And then he said, well, what about the week after? I said, well, I'm still on my American book tour, I'm afraid. So um, this one is the longest I've done, and I'm sort of ricocheting from one city to another. So I have to keep reminding myself that I'm in Washington because uh, I've just flown in from Denver, and yesterday I was in Austin. So someone's having fun with my aircraft sh flight plan, you know, because it looks ridiculous, quite frankly, because I was in Houston last week, and quite frankly, you know. Um, I, um, I think... It's it's fun doing a book tour, um, and I I mean I've done a lot of book tours in different countries, uh, and I, I think it would be interesting to mention some because they're kind of they're a sort of litmus test of what a country's like and what what it's going through. Um, the last time I was here, which is about two years ago, uh, it was just before the election, and I'd had great fun going around America asking uh, the media escorts, the drivers. Um, you know who they were going to vote for and why, and um, and I felt like a sort of one man Gallup poll, so it was really useful, um, actually. But in November, I did a I did a Greek book tour, which is something I hadn't ever done before, for obvious uh, reasons, uh, not least because they've never actually paid um, any of my royalties. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so I was a little reluctant, but then I told myself, well, you know, you're an author, you should, you should go to interesting places, you know, in that kind of Confucian curse kind of interesting way. Um, and I said, well, look, I'll come on one condition, that um, I get to stay at that hotel, the Grand Hotel. If you've ever seen the news footage of um, uh, riots in the city of Athens, they, they're all filmed from this particular hotel. So I thought, well, that's obviously a good place to stay. Because uh, you can see everything. And quite apart from that, it's also got a spectacular view on the, on the roof. If you ever go to Athens, and I'm sure some of you have been, on the left, as you, as you look, there's um, the Parliament, and on the right is the Acropolis. And, it's, and at night, it's a fantastic, fantastic view. Anyway, um, the, there was a general strike, obviously, on the day uh, that I arrived. And so we were lucky to land at all, I think, to be honest. But... Um, Having got off the plane, I then discovered there was a taxi strike and there were no taxis at all. Um, but I was rather pleased and delighted to discover that my publisher had arrived, who was a rather tall, beautiful, blonde Greek lady, who then drove me um, into the centre of Athens. And the bookstore was uh, right around the corner from the, the hotel. And every day, I was there for three and a half, four days, every day I would walk around the corner and be interviewed by television and radio. And they all wanted to know the same thing. Why do the Germans hate us so much? <laughs> and I said, well, no, they don't hate you at all. I mean, they don't hate you. Um, it's just that, frankly, you know, they think that you could spend your money on some better things. I mean, for instance, I pointed out, which didn't necessarily make me all that popular, why have the Greeks got the largest standing army in Europe? Incredible. I mean, some of them didn't know that, to be honest, but there we are. 
Um, and um, the, the other thing they really wanted to know about was the comparison between uh, Greece and the Weimar Republic in the late 1920s. The comparisons are there. It, you know, a currency in a state of semi-collapse, um, the rise of the right wing, which really obsesses uh, Greek liberals, obviously. There's an, uh, a bunch called the Golden Dawn who managed to get 20% of the vote. And then it's as usual, it's not that I think people want the right wing to take power. It's almost like, look, sort it out. This is, you know, otherwise we'll, you know, we'll kick you. And the, but the only way we can think of kicking you is to give you give a vote for the for the Golden Dawn. Anyway, um, on the final night I was there, um, it just so happened I was going to have to do an event in a bookshop much like this. And it was also the night when the Greek Parliament was going to vote on the budget. And I said to the, the woman, uh, surely no one's going to come because, you know, your country is going to hell in a handcart tonight. Um, and <laughs> who's going to want to hear, you know, the pontifications of some Brit? And she said, oh, well, no, no, people will come, yeah, you because know, you've said some very harsh things about the right wing in the newspapers. <laughs> And I said, uh, really? And then she showed me this um, picture of myself, you know, sort of uh, holding forth in, in one of the main papers in, in Greece. And I said, well, what does it say, for Christ's sake? And she said, well, you said th they were bankrupt of ideas, as is typical of the right wing. And frankly, you know, that they, they blamed the same old enemies as usual and anyone who voted for them. And I thought, oh, please stop. <laughs> and she said, and what will you do if they turn up and disrupt your reading? or attack you. And I said, well, yeah, thanks for the heads up, you know. Um, so, um, well, in the event, they didn't come, uh, and but the, the place was packed. There were about 300 people there, so it was quite gratifying. But at the same time, every time I looked up, I could see tens of thousands of people, literally, walking past the front door of the bookshop with placards and bullhorns and anarchist flags. And it was kind of, uh, it was weird. It was just weird. Um, and um, afterwards, it got slightly weirder because she said, I was going to take you to this charming little Greek restaurant, uh, but unfortunately all the windows got kicked in and they've had to close. Um, so uh, she said, where do you think we should go? I said, well, we'll go back to the Grand Hotel. We're bound to get something there. So we walked back to the Grand Hotel. The square's all closed off because it's all kicking off, as we say. And um, so we found the back door, got in, walked into the lobby, where a man then handed me a, a bottle of mineral water and a face cloth, which I thought was, you know, unusual. <laughs> I thought, am I looking dirty? But then I realized why, because then my, ear, my eyes started to stream because there was tear gas seeping under the, the shutters of, and this is the Grand Hotel. So I'm sort of wiping my eyes and I said, well, let's go upstairs because uh, there's a restaurant upstairs with the spectacular view of the parliament and the Acropolis. Uh, and so, um, we went up there and enjoyed a very fine bottle of champagne while we watched the riot from the um, from the from the rooftop, which struck me as a very sort of Hemingwayish sort of thing to do. Really, um, I've always had my suspicions about um, Hemingway and how much comfort he was in when he was reporting. Anyway, um, the next morning, I went out to get a, go and get a newspaper, and um, I discovered that somebody had turned up with a hammer during the riot and had literally hammered off all the marble on the front of the hotel, the steps, the whole lot. And I said to the concierge guy, I said, look, is this envy? Or is it because they don't like rich people or people who stay in grand hotels and that stuff? He said, no, 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 nothing like that. He said, they use the marble as to throw at the cops. <laughs> and um, I said, well, right, when you're never getting the Elgin marbles back, <laughs> okay? Because if this is what happens to the f bloody Grand Hotel, I mean, you know. Um, so that that was the Greek book tour. As I say, each each tour is a little litmus test of of being in a country. And it, Italian book tour was something very different. My Italian book tour kicked off like this. I came down the steps of the Alitalia aircraft to find an official car. This is a few years ago, Mike. An official Italian government car parked at the bottom of the steps with a little flag. And my publisher, who was the minister of the Italian language, because only in Italy do you have a minister in charge of a language. Um, I don't know what it would be in Britain, actually. You know, 
anyway, um, he was standing there. Uh, his name was Stefano de Passigli, and he's a count, and he's terribly smooth, good-looking, sort of Italian. And I said, oh, Stefano, um, well, I'm very honored. Um, thank you for coming to meet me in this car. And he said, well, Philip, I, I had nothing better to do, you know. The government fell half an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> so we sort of slipped off in this uh, car with a little motorcycle outrider. And um, that night, he'd arranged a fabulous dinner for uh, Roman booksellers in um, the Institute of Philology. And um, I, about halfway through I, uh, this dinner, I sort of looked around and I, I said to Stefano, um, Stefano, I can't help noticing, but all of the booksellers are women. And he looked at me and he said, Philip, I, I don't think you would want me to invite the men booksellers, surely. <laughs> Without a hint of, you know, embarrassment, you know. That's, um, the next day, he took me to lunch, and the, uh, there was a lot of lunch, by the way, involved in a, in a book tour, except not this one, because I just my lunch was a, a bottle of muscle milk uh, um, today. 160 calories, good stuff. And the next day, he took me to lunch in the Senate, and um, we had a flight to Milan at 2.15, and at 1.15, we were still uh, in the Senate. And... Finally, he got up from the table and we walked to the, the door, and only to meet the then Prime Minister, uh, who was called Renato Prodi. And so Stefano and Prodi then had a long conversation uh, about, you know, the government. And I'm looking at my watch, and I'm sort of saying, you know, looking like this, to st but you don't want to interrupt <coughs> the Prime Minister, for Pete's sake. So about... Um, about 1.35, I really am tapping quite loudly, and, and Stefano says, oh, yes, Philip, you're right, we're, we're, we're going to miss the plane. And I said, well, yes, we are. So we get in the car, and we speed off at about 100 miles an hour, and all the time I'm thinking, Princess Diana, you know. <laughs> and I'm sort of trying to haul on the, on the seatbelt, and he looks at me rather pityingly, he says, oh, Philip, don't do it. it doesn't work. <laughs> so I gave up on that. And then he picked up his phone and he rang somebody senior in Alitalia. And he, he said, Sono Senatore Persigli, and I'm going to be late. And um, believe it or not, they held the plane. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the wonderful thing about doing a, a book tour in Italy. I'll just I'll make a, a, another little quick story about um, French book tours, because French book tours, they, how they used to kick off was you would go, you'd get off at Gare du Nord from a, a two and a half hour journey from London on the, on the Eurostar, which was fabulous. And my publisher then was called DDA, and he'd be standing at the end of the, the platform. And um, I would say, so what's on, the, what's, what's on the agenda, the schedule? Let's have a look. And he says, well, Philip, uh, we have lunch at uh, 1 o'clock, and maybe, maybe uh, something in the afternoon with Liberation, the newspaper. We'll see. But the most important thing was obviously lunch and then dinner, and then lunch. And I, over the next few days, uh, and on every book tour, this is what it was like, I would get taken to the finest restaurants in Paris, um, as a result of which I, I have a really compendious knowledge of fine dining in, in Paris now. Um, including, if you go, just quickly, uh, there's a place called La Perouse, which is a wonderful place. Um, and it, again, what's, what's so typically French about this is that uh, you have it in a little kind of um, smoked glass booth, um, beautiful table, fine linen, etc. At the end is a bed. <laughs> and, <laughs> and at the end of the lunch, the maitre d' comes up with a little silver tray and there's a key on the, on the little tray. And he leaves you alone, presumably with your mistress, and you lock the door. <laughs> and <laughs> could anything be more DSK than that? <laughs> than that. I don't think so. Well, poor Didier is no longer my publisher. Uh, he was fired. Um, his expenses were so high. <laughs> so I felt a sort of degree of guilt, actually, um, for having participated in the circumstances of his, uh, his departure. However, um, oh yeah, and there was one other occasion. We, we were sitting there in a, a restaurant, and he says, oh, Philip, yes, we must go. You have to be at the Sorbonne at four o'clock. I said, oh, right, well, you, you should have, perhaps you should have told me, you know, I could have prepared something. Oh, so you just have to be on a panel and ask, yeah, answer a few questions. So I went to the Sorbonne, and I got up on the panel, and um, 
the, the audience filled up. And again, I noticed that it was all women. And um, also I noticed that there were on, on the panel was a woman who I know, know quite well as a good friend, Val McDermott, who's a crime writer. Uh, well, Val is a, a, a very open lesbian. Uh, indeed, sitting next to her, I did feel like the man who'd had sand kicked in his face. Um, and I suddenly realized that everybody in the audience was probably a lesbian. And um, the first question I got from the floor was, Mr. Kerr, how come you understand lesbians so well in your last book? <laughs> and um, which was called a philosophical investigation. And indeed, the heroine is, is, is indeed a, a lesbian. And I said, well, could it be that I'm attracted to the same thing you are? <laughs> and and that, that was kind of the limit of my insight, really, into, into being a lesbian. But I mean, I, I, I felt there was a degree of honor involved. You know, I felt I'd been given a sort of honorary lesbian status. I, f I didn't actually make the remark I dearly did want to make that I always felt like I was a, um, a lesbian trapped in a man's body. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, usually, uh, the travel that I undertake uh, has more to do with what I'm writing, and consequently, I've because uh, I'm very much a writer who believes in yes, doing the book research at home, but there's no substitute for actually tramping around the streets and uh, experiencing the city on foot. Uh, and I always say to anyone who's planning to write a book, walk, walk the city. Never have a professional researcher because they will always filter the information. Um, and you have to encounter the, the experience, uh, not just, the, uh, not just the, the, the facts, but the feeling as well. It's a bit Robert De Niro, this kind of you know, method acting theory of how to write a book, but it, it does work. Um, uh, because you get, you get ideas and you get feelings and you get sensations and they, they, they go in a book. And I'll give you a very good example. I um, had to write about uh, a place called Wevelsberg, which is a little castle in northern Westphalia in Germany that Himmler had bought. And he bought this place uh, because he was planning to make it the center of uh, the new SS state of Burgundy. Uh, and this was going to be the spiritual headquarters of the SS, this, this little castle. And then he, um, and he took a whole load of so Soviet POWs, about 800 people, and worked them to death to build a crypt in this castle where sort of along sort of Arthurian lines where sort of SS generals, when they died, would eventually, their ashes would be interred. So creepy concept. Um, and I, I was planning to visit this place. I was in um, Amsterdam, and I rang up. And I said, have you got a... Uh, oh, yeah, I, f I forgot to mention. It was, it's now a youth hostel. Um, only the Germans could turn a... Oh, no, no. no. Um, it's a youth hostel now. So I bought myself a little youth hosteling card. And I thought, well, that, that's, that's all I need to get in this place. So I, I rang up. And um, I said, um, do you have a, a bed? No, we are completely full. So I thought, well, you know, I've got to go anyway, because regardless of whether f they're full or not, even if I have to sleep in the car. So I drove all the way there to this place, it was about four, four hours. And um, when I got there, it was literally, it was Halloween. It was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> uh, wind lashed the, the flagpole um, and rattled the, the lanyard on the, on the, on the flag. Um, and I knocked at the door. And it was huge, heavy. It was like Dracula's castle, honestly. And uh, I opened the door, and this Igor figure was standing there. Yes. I held up my youth hostel card. I said, um, I'd like a bed for the night, please. Walk this way. It was like that scene in Young Frankenstein, <laughs> you know, except that I said, I didn't say, well, I don't know if I can, you know. Um, but I did indeed follow him down into the depths of this castle. And he walked me past one empty dormitory after another. The place was completely empty. And I got to the final dormitory, and um, he pointed to the, the bed nearest the corner and said, this is your bed. And <laughs> so slightly unnerved, I, said, I thought, well, I better get some drink inside me pretty quickly if I'm going to stay here. So I said, is there, a, is there a little hof in the vicinity where I could get some dinner? And, yes, there's a little hof down the hill you could try there. So I walked down the esplanade, 
And uh, there was indeed a little hof in this kind of Hansel and Gretel, Gretel little village, which was full of little half-timbered houses. But the, the houses had creepy gold runes painted on them, like something from an M.R. James story, quite literally, which didn't sort of lend itself to me feeling comfortable there particularly. Anyway, um, I walked in the hof, and it was like, it was like the scene in um, Frankenstein, uh, when everybody goes silent as you walk in the door and look at you. Well, I sat down. Uh, the waitress handed me a, a menu, and I ordered. And then I looked down at the side of my seat, and there was a, and it was beautifully carved oak. Um, and on the side was a, a skull and crossbones, a death's head. And then I thought, well, you know, it's nicely carved. Perhaps they just didn't want to vandalize it, you know. So if they'd been Greeks, of course, they would have done. And, um, and then I looked up at the ceiling, and there were, it was the double lightning SS uh, flash carved again beautifully on the, on the ceiling. And so I, I had a very good dinner, and I went to the men's room, and I walked down this long corridor on these bits of brown paper sort of taped to the wall. And I thought, well, I've got a seat behind one of these bits of brown paper. So I tugged one off, and they were all men in SS uniform. And they were all young men, and more disturbing yet, they were all recent photographs. And it was my little John Voigt Odessa file uh, moment, because I suddenly realized I was in what was probably the spot where fascists and Nazis continue to uh, congregate in Germany, albeit a very small number of people, but nonetheless slightly disturbing. Uh, more disturbing was the discovery that I couldn't actually get the brown paper back on the over the picture uh, and I sort of <laughs> get thinking you know well you know perhaps I'm, I, I ought to get out of here as soon as possible now um, well I went back to the castle and endured a very uncomfortable night and got up early and had a good sneak around in the small hours uh, but that's the kind of thing you do um, in order to find um, truth as it were in order to sort of experience the the stuff you've actually been writing about and a lot of that went into the into the book uh, and I as I say I firmly believe this is this is the best way uh, to do it I mean <clears throat> I do take it to sort of uh, slightly absurd lengths um, and I know it's absurd but uh, and if it makes me seem like a sort of geek then so be it um, I've been commissioned by a German film company to write um, a film about uh, the, the same people who did uh, Untergang, the, the downfall. Um, a, a film about the early years of Hitler, and in particular, um, the Munich Post. The Munich Post was a newspaper that consistently opposed Hitler uh, between 1924 and 1933, and they wrote many stories uh, uh, hoping to embarrass Hitler. And uh, so I went to Munich several times, and amongst the things I did was to uh, find his um, old apartment building and wait for an opportunity to go in. So I sort of hung around outside, um, and then when someone came out, I sort of dashed so that the door wouldn't close uh, and walked up what was quite actually quite a nice little building inside and walked up the, the stairs, and all the time, you know, I'm thinking... Who, who walked up these stairs? Who walked up these stairs? And then finally paused in front of Hitler's own front door and sort of almost was tempted to knock just in order to see who would, who would come to the door. And it's, it, it's astonishing the sort of feelings you start to get when you sort of confront uh, um, a, a situation like that. But again, um, useful because it, it went in the script. I should also say something about the, um, the Munich Post because I think it's one of the most interesting things I've discovered in all my years of research. Um, the Munich Post, all of the, nearly all of the pieces in the paper didn't have a byline for obvious reasons. Um, from about 1930 to 1932, they, they started to take Hitler very seriously indeed, when before they thought, like most people, he was a bit of a clown. But um, after he got about 109 seats in the 1930 election, they had to take him seriously. And the story, I suppose, that I find both uh, fascinating and shocking is this. In November 1932, this is like two months before Hitler comes to power, they published a story which was, uh, I think the headline was, The Final Solution 
of the Jewish problem in Germany, what the Nazis have planned for Germany's Jews and Europe's Jews too. And the story went on with remarkable foresight. It said, um, what the Nazis have planned will be the removal of the Jew, as the Nazis call him, from all public life. Uh, Jews will be forbidden to be lawyers, doctors, dentists, teachers, etc., etc. Jews will be deported, quotes, to the swamps of the East, where cold malnutrition and disease will take care of the majority. Those left will be dealt with. Now, that's the story they published in November 1932. Uh, they must have had a source very high up in the Nazi party because um, it's certain that this was not... And I think the real tragedy is, of course, that they published this story and possibly just nobody believed it. Um, the paper had a circulation of about 100,000 in Munich. Uh, and I can only conclude nobody believed it. Uh, so the next time someone says to you, you know, well, the... the, the Final Solution didn't get going till the Van Say Conference, te almost, well, 10 years later. You can quote this story in the Munich Post, because although it wasn't planned in detail, it was certainly an intention, a clear intention of Hitler to murder Europe's Jews, right from the word go. Um, my new book, which I've obviously not talked about at all, is um, A Man Without Breath. I'd always wanted to write about the Cat and Forest Massacre. Uh, I'd mentioned the fact that um, my character, Bernie Gunther, has something to do with the investigation. Um, and yet I'd not never been able to find much more than a... There were, there were about a couple of decent books on the subject and not much else, really. Um, and I was waiting for the for the key that would unlock the whole story. I'm very much a believer in allowing history to sort of take me by the hand and waiting for the right thing to come along. And finally, I, I got hold of an SS map. The SS, of course, who believed that uh, Western Russia was theirs and it would be theirs in perpetuity after they invaded. Um, when they invaded cities, the first thing they did was um, get the cartographers in and rename all the city streets. So Smolensk, which is about eight miles um, east of Katyn, um, was then completely renamed uh, with German names, of course. Uh, and so th it's astonishing. You look at a map of Smolensk today and a map of, of, Ger of Smolensk c compiled by the, the Nazis. And, um, you know, it, it's, they almost don't bear any relation at all, apart from the, the geographical ones. So this was my my key into the whole thing. Uh, the other thing um, that I discovered when I started to look into this was that um, the man who was credited, if you like, with the discovery of um, the first bodies in Katyn was a very senior in intelligence colonel, a, a Prussian aristocrat called Rudolf Freiherr von Gerstorff, and a um, very, very brave man because Virtually on the day that he found uh, the first body at Katyn, he'd been involved in as many as three plots to kill Hitler in as many months. Um, he, was, uh, he had lots of friends uh, who were Prussian aristocrats. He and another aristocrat had flown down from Berlin to Smolensk with the aim of persuading Field Marshal von Klug, who was commander of Army Group Center, to um, help them assassinate Hitler. They knew he was coming on a visit it was a rare occasion when he stepped out of the safety of the wolf's lair. Uh, and the idea was that all of the off assembled officers would draw their pistols and shoot him. And von Klug was a little bit, you know, he, he wasn't so sure, possibly be because, in fact, I'm almost certain, uh, that he'd already been bribed by Hitler uh, several years before uh, with a very large check. And indeed, when Hitler arrived in Smolensk, he did indeed bring his checkbook and wrote out another fat check for von Kluge while he was there. This is a policy that Hitler um, used again and again, where when extortion and blackmail didn't work, then bribery was, was quite something, it was uh, something he often resorted to. Um, so uh, having received his fat check, von Kluge said to the other, uh, his fellow aristocrats, well, I think perhaps we've been a little hasty. But the other aristocrats, suspecting perhaps that von Kluge would, would have cold feet, uh, had brought a bomb from uh, Berlin 
uh, which was supposed to be two bottles of Cointreau. Uh, they were given to Hitler's pilot uh, to take to one of their pals in uh, Rastenburg. That was the story, uh, with the idea that they would blow up uh, midair. And of course, they didn't. So that went wrong. And then uh, just a short while after that, von Gerstorff was asked, was given the signal honor of being selected to uh, escort Hitler around what's called the Zeughaus, the arsenal in Berlin, which is still there. Uh, and every year Hitler would make a speech on Veterans Day about how well everything was going, etc., etc. And then to the assembled generals and senior bigwigs, Bonzen in the Wehrmacht. And at the end of the speech, um, the designated officer would give Hitler a, a tour, and they, you know, they sort of crow over the, you know, the, the spoils of war that they'd assembled, such as sort of, you know, Napoleon's hat, which uh, he left behind in a carriage after the Battle of Waterloo. And I guess Hitler had seen the hat before, um, because the tour was curtailed after a couple of minutes, which was a pity, because von Gerstorff had two landmines in his trouser pockets. Um, and he'd, uh, there was a detonator in each one, which he'd, um, he'd broken, the, there were mercury detonators, and he'd broken the mercury detonator in each one. And so he figured that there was about 10 minutes before, before they went off, killing him and Hitler at the same time. So when Hitler cleared off, uh, then he had a sort of quick, you know, a dilemma, you know, what am I gonna do? So a quick trip to the men's room was, um, was in order in order to remove the detonators before the, uh, the bombs went off. Um, so all of these things came together, plus one other thing which I, I must mention was, was the existence of the German War Crimes Bureau, which was a uh, little, uh, you know, people sort of frown when they hear that the Germans had their own work at War Crimes Bureau. It was a perfectly logical thing to do. They'd had one during the First World War uh, because the Prussian army run by aristocrats felt there was a proper way of running a war. Um, so when the Second World War came around, they thought, well, yeah, we, we ought to have this again, because they knew full well that there would be crimes committed against German soldiers in any war. Uh, war crimes are committed by all sides, obviously, um, not just by the Germans. There were war crimes committed by the Poles and indeed by the British. We were quite fond of um, uh, torpedoing hospital ships because we knew they were full of... Um, pilots, Luftwaffe pilots returning to Germany. So you could say by any standard that was indeed a war crime. Um, so um, they decided they were going to have this um, War Crimes Bureau again. Uh, and it was the War Crimes Bureau that uh, was officially designated uh, as the proper organization to, to investigate Katyn. Um, the, 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 the hypocritical fact, of course, was that they knew full well that the SS uh, could be 10 miles up the road um, murdering Jews, uh, and yet they were still prepared to um, try the occasional German soldier for the, the rape and murder of a Russian peasant woman. Um, and so, again, the sort of hypocrisy of it sort of fascinated me. And, and these are all the sort of things I like to sort of stir into the, into the mixing bowl of, uh, of a Bernie Gunther novel. So um, I've rattled away uh, for 35 minutes, which was my, uh, which I was ordered to do. <laughs> uh, before taking questions from the floor. So anyone who has a question, uh, please pipe up. And, um, um, ah, is right, okay? oh, it's, a, it's a performing yeah. question, okay. right. Uh, this is a question that I've been wanting to ask for years and years and years, <coughs> since you're big on details. Um, a, a, a device that's usually used in stories like the ones you write is people being uh, rendered unconscious by being hit on the head. And the question is, how easy is that to do without killing them? <laughs> well, uh, all I can say is, sir, I've been knocked out myself a couple of times, and um, I'm still here to tell the tale. N no, I know you can get knocked out without yeah. being killed, but the question is, if you're doing it deliberately to try and knock someone unconscious as yeah. opposed to... <clears throat> oh, yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I, I mean, usually, the, see, the, the borderline between uh -huh. the well, two. Well, Bernie's more often knocked out than <laughs> does knocking out. I mean, yes. um, he, he does. he's more likely to be, uh, I would say, more likely to sort of take it further. I can't say much more than, than that without perhaps spoiling the novel. He's more likely to take it further than, than just a bit of knocking out. You see, Bernie's not, an, he's, a, he's an anti-heroic hero. He's not a true hero. Um, true heroes are boring. 
And it's much more interesting to write about someone who's got feet of clay and who occasionally does something for which he then feels a degree of shame. Um, and that's the kind of character I want to write. I mean, it's what makes a good novel. It's, it, it's boring to write about people who are always good. I mean, if you read Marlowe, I mean, Marlowe does some things that he's not entirely happy about. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, it didn't. Okay, <laughs> fine. Okay, well, I can't please all the people all the time, obviously, you know. But thank you, uh, Carl, for um, asking that. <laughs> Anyone actually, else? Actually, uh, uh, it's, it's a well-established tradition that uh, policemen and private eyes are knocked out. It happens to Philip Marlowe and Sam Spade all the time. So, right, thank you. So you're in the step, you're in the footsteps of Raymond Chandler. And, uh, well, it's a, a get out of cl jail clause sometimes, yes, you know, is, uh, is get knocked out, you know. Um, it does sort of move the action on. I mean, but Marla used to, it, so Chandler used to say, you know, if he ran out of inspiration, you'd have a man walk through a door with a gun in his hand. Well, I tend to have a, na a real-life Nazi walk through uh, a door rather than just a, a man with a gun. Sorry, sir, carry on. Uh, I've been a, a Bernie Gunther uh, fan for a long time. Uh, you know, that the idea that he is imperfect, and, uh, but that he has a, a morally, morally righteous uh, center uh, that guides him is, uh, is a, uh, it's, it's an interesting foil for, for the start of a plot, for a very intricate plot, keeps you, in, keeps you engaged all the way through. Uh, but I have, I have a question that you've probably been asked a good deal in the past. Is he modeled after any, any real uh, Kripo uh, uh, a person, or is he purely a work of imagination? He's mainly a work of imagination. Um, there are there, there there are very few books about uh, the real police. Um, I mean, the, only, the only works about the real police are like Ordinary Men, Police Battalion 101. Actually, there was one published about 40 years ago by a Japanese um, professor at Yale University, who wrote a book about um, Kripo in the during and before the war, um, which is possibly the the only one there is. But he's not really based on. He's a. He's a. Um, he, he. If you like, he's a kind of everyman figure. He's only ever designed to be an everyman figure. Um, you see, originally I didn't want. I, I didn't necessarily want to be a, a crime writer at all. In fact, I don't really think of myself as a crime writer. I think of myself as more as a political writer. Um, um, I'm more interested in his politics. He's not a particularly. Um, committed policeman uh, in a lot of ways, but he is his politics are interesting. He's a left man of the left. S he's probably would have voted for the SPD during uh, when the when the Weimar Republic was in existence. Um, and he, um, it's really his his anti-Nazi um, beliefs that I like to sort of see challenged again and again as he's right. put into a a more difficult situation. He's painted into a corner. Well, I think that's the lot. So I will say thank you very much. Say thank you. And thank you for coming.